You are now listening to Bigfoot and Beyond, featuring the OG bad boys of Bigfoot, the Dr. Heckle and Mr. Jive of Squatchology, the Chip and Dale of Bigfoot, and I'm not talking about the cartoon. Please welcome your hosts, the Bigfoot celebrity couple, Biff Clobo, better known as Cliff Berrickman and James Bobo Fay. Hello, Cliff. Hello, Bobo. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Heat wave's over. Uh, museum is cruising along. It's tourist season. I got some Bigfoot stuff on the horizon, and yeah, everything's just great. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so I got a different kind of guest for us today. You know how we always hear about people bringing up the Nephilim from the Bible, the half man, half an- or the half beast, half angel, man beast things. Yeah, yeah, sure. Every religion has their take on this thing because Sasquatches have been around forever, being just regular animals. And so every religion, whether it's Christianity or Mormonism or uh, Hinduism, they have their own take on these sort of things. So yeah, the Nephilim, of course, are the Christian take on these things. Kind of like the the way that the, those ancient people describe their world and explain things that they observed. Yeah, so I got contacted by one of our listeners, Michael Gagliardi. I, he'll say it properly. He believes in his position. He's a scholar on these kind of things. He studied the Bible. I'll, I'll let him go into that. But he's he's internationally traveled, following up on this sort of things. He knows you're going to ask rigorous, rigorous academic style questions. Uh, you're going to challenge his assumptions or beliefs or his statements. So he's not going to take offense. It's going to be a real, hopefully no one takes offense to the Cliff's uh, line of questioning or some of mine even. Well, no, because things that are real can withstand the scrutiny. And I think any, anything that somebody believes to be true, they should be prepared to perhaps defend against intelligent questions. And I mean, if if I do ask something pointed, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but I'm trying to represent a a significant portion of our audience who would probably want to ask the same thing. Yep, exactly. Well, I think on that uh, note, without further ado, we have Michael Gagliardi, or however I butchered that, I'll say it properly. We got Michael coming on to straighten us out. Michael, welcome to Bigfoot and Beyond. Hi, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. And that's Michael Anthony Gagliardi, <laughs> or Gagliardi for you American people. <laughs> I'm Italian. <laughs> now, are, were you born in Italy or uh, just Italian descent? No, my parents are, are uh, uh, they left after the war. And uh, I'm first generation. I was actually born in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. But uh, I've migrated down when I was 19 years old uh, to California via the uh, music explosion in the 80s. And I've been here ever since, going on 36 years now. Nice. Nice. So do you have dual citizenship between Canada and the United States? Or uh, just are you purely American citizenship now or Canadian or what are you? No, that was the one smart thing that I did was never give up my Canadian citizenship. I kept that, but I'm a permanent resident alien, but I am applying for a uh, Italian uh, citizenship because you can have dual if your parents are from there. They have a, this new law called the Sangue Law, which is the bloodline, means the bloodline law, because they're, they're losing a lot of people in, in Italy because there's not very, the population is small and most of the people that live in Italy are immigrants and the, the children move away. So they're losing their real population, their real heritage. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I, I want to reconnect with that. Nice. And do you speak, do you speak Italian? Uh, not bad. Not bad. My dad might disagree with you. because <laughs> He speaks four dialects and most of it's swearing. But the, no, he's proficient in Italian. But uh, he speaks dialect. I speak more of uh, the traditional Italian uh, where everything ends in a vowel. So you must have grown up Catholic then, right? Uh, no, no. Actually, my family's my family was um, atheist, and then my mother became a Jehovah's Witness, and that's a whole that's a whole nother show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I actually have a book coming out in August uh, that is uh, all about my childhood, which is one of my bullet points for speaking on this kind of stuff. And you have such an interesting life because we were chatting before the recording started and you shared with us that you are a professional musician for a living. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a flamenco guitar player and a jazz guitar player. I have a jazz band, which I play around a lot. I've opened for B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Aaron Neville, a whole bunch of guys. And then I have a rock band that has played with Y&T, L.A. Guns, Asia, and we're starting back up in July. So... That's that's my bread and butter, basically. 
Nice. You want to plug your band real fast so people can take a listen if they want to hear it? Yeah. Well, the uh, the jazz band and flamenco stuff is just Michael Anthony Gagliardi. And my rock band is 3TB. It has nothing to do with the uh, modem or data speed on your computer. What about tuberculosis? Does that have anything yeah. to do with that? <laughs> Three guys with tuberculosis. Yeah. We're actually <laughs> a trio. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You always wear masks. Right, exactly. It's not a COVID thing at all. <laughs> and our fans have dubbed us the angry rush because we're progressive and aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> and we're a trio. So how does a first-generation Italian-Canadian raised as an atheist become a biblical scholar? Well, that's exactly what my book is all about. It's called Devil Take the Hindmost, and it's coming out in August. Right now, it's, it's finished being edited. That is a really long story, but this is what the book is about. And so far, my synopsis, I've sent to a few people, and I've had some major producers who are really interested in making this a movie because it's an incredible story that uh, I, I am even here today and survived what I went through. Well, it sounds like a different, that's a, that's, that's going to be a whole different uh, pod uh, episode because this one we're going to go on an affiliate. <laughs> yeah, but it has, it has to do with demons. That's for sure. Okay. Well, lay it on us. Yeah. So what is all this demon stuff? I mean, I, my, my wife's in the horror movies. I've only been exposed to the media uh, version of what demons, uh, whatever they are actually are. Um, so what, what in the world's going on? Well, this, this is exactly what I speak on. I'm also a lecturer and a speaker. I, I speak on, on demonology. You know, when we look at something, you know, anything, you know, all of us are kind of like investigators. And when we look, say, a car crash at an, in, at an uh, intersection, uh, we have four points of perception in that, in that uh, accident. From one side, you're going to see the bloody mess. From the opposite side, you'll see no damage on one car if it's a T-bone. And from the other perspectives, you might see something partial or, you know, some evidence on another side of how it actually happened. So that's basically where I come in. Um, I'm a very scholarly guy that dots my, dots my I's and crosses my T's. Um, like I said, an investigation to me is, an assist, is a systematic attempt to learn the truth of a matter for that moment which is hidden. And the first thing I go into is, is I got to find a foundation, uh, you know, an underlying support that supports a principle. You know, what is the value of this? And then I begin with origins, the point or place where something begins or rises or is derived from. And I've been, I've been studying, you know, especially Bigfoot since I was nine years old. I got my first book on it. But uh, uh, I really trying to find the origins of these things, the origins, the foundations. You know, I, I know what you guys do. You, you guys go out into the field and you look for the evidence. What I do is go back in time looking for the evidence, looking for the beginnings looking for the cross patterns. If you ever see a uh, TV show with investigators, they, you know, they got a wall with all these pictures on the wall and of suspects. And then they've got lines drawn to here, timelines and all this kind of stuff to, And they're doing that to derive, you know, the truth. And this is exactly what I have done over the last 35 years. And, uh, I found by reading all of the texts, you know, the Quran, the Septuagint, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the uh, Sumerian texts, the tablets, that really it all begins in Genesis 3.15. And they all cross-reference each other. And so where we find this, where my research actually begins is Genesis 3.15. We see that after, after the fall, God's curse is upon Satan and Adam and Eve. And God says to Satan, I will put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. Now, the first question you would ask yourself is, who is this seed? Because he specifically directs to Satan that I will put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. Well, we know who the woman's seed is, but who is Satan's seed? Well, by Genesis 6, three chapters later, uh, we begin to see that uh, um, the daughters of men who were born unto them 
that the sons of God saw that they were beautiful and took away and took many that they chose. Now, I'm a scholar of languages as well. Archaeology, physics, quantum physics, all of this stuff has to pass the litmus test like Cliff was saying. It should stand under scrutiny. Now, when I look at the original English or the original uh, um, Hebrew in this, the sons of God is the Bana a Elohim, which means there's only one translation for this, and it is the direct creation of God. So these are the angels. These are the angels. And we know if you want to take the apocryphal texts that are the uh, non-canonical those are the ones in Nicaea in 325, which they excluded from putting in the Bible. So you've got the uh, um, Book of the Giants, you've got Jasher, you've got uh, the Book of Enoch, and, and, and so on. Yeah, that's where like the, the, the Gospel of Mary and all those other um, Gnostic, Gnostic texts are. Yeah, are, there's a reason yeah. why they were not included. It was the power structure of the church, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, there was a lo- there's a lot of things. So anyway... We get from this that these sons of God, and it shows up in the Septuagint, that uh, there's a scripture there that says that uh, in Second Peter, that Peter says, you know, if God did not spare the angels that sinned, these ones that came down and took off their habitation and came down to earth, basically to create this mischief. So what they did was, it, the, the actual word, the actual word is oikotirion. It means something that they physically removed from themselves. They took it off because angels do not procreate. You can see that in any religion, uh, you know, for celestial beings, they do not procreate. Okay, they do not procreate. But for some reason, they did this. They came, they decided to come here. They land down Mount Hermon, which, by the way, Mount Hermon, the word Hermon, means devoted to destruction. And if you read one of the books, the book of Enoch, it says that they all made a pact. And they said, hey, I don't want to be the, you know, the lead guy, Azazel. He says, I don't want to be the guy that gets, it, that gets this you know, punishment for this great sin that we're about to do. I want to make sure that you guys are all in on this together. So they make this pact and they come down to Mount Hermon and, and uh, they decide to, uh, you know, and the words, therefore, when they take m- women as their wives, this is where we get that, uh, that uh, comical uh, cartoon of the caveman hitting the woman on the head. This is from beyond medieval days, you know, and this is where we get that from. And, and so what happens is these guys or these fallen angels, because now they're fallen because they've been kicked out of heaven. And they they fall to Mount Hermon. They take wives, and then they bear these children called the Nephilim. Now the word Nephilim, so you got It's very important to to look at all the dotted I's and T's of this stuff. Uh, the word Nephilim is Hebrew. The meaning means the fallen ones or the deserters. So all of this stuff, it, it is impossible to conspire all of these terms and stuff. When you look at the whole thing over thousands of years and what all see every culture on the planet has these these things in common. They all have a flood story. They all have a celestial visitation story and they all have a demigod story with giants that rule their lands. It doesn't matter if you're in the South Pacific if no matter where you are in India, you have all of these things happening at the same time. And when we look back, we see that by 2100 BC, now this is when the, Su- the Sumerians, see, we're going to get into the Sumerians here. We see that the Sumerians are, are the land now is filled with these Nephilim. And we see that. We see that in the Bible. It says that there's the Anunnaki, uh, the, the Zamzuman. Uh, there's several tribes, several of these tribes. And it's mentioned in every other, you know, uh, textual script, Sanskrit, and all of this uh, kind of thing. So we know that this, ba- this Bana Elohim, they have these children, and they're, they're called the heroes of old or the men of renown, 
The Hebrew word for that is the Hagabarim. And in the Greek, in the Septuagint, now if you know anything about the Greek language, the Greek language is so specific that five words have to define a word's factuality. So they're intense. They're intense people. The word Hagabarim in the Greek is the Titans. Thus you get your, from the Greek side of it anyway, you get your Titans. Who are what? Demigods, all of their Hercules and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And you know, you're right, Cliff. Uh, when you did mention that everyone uh, tries to uh, interpret uh, these things by their own, in their own region, that's exactly what they do. But I'm here to tell you that all of these things around the whole world are all the same thing. They are demons. They are the demons. And these are the doctrines of demons. What is that, though? Because what demon is just a word that we're slapping on something else, and and in our culture, because what I'm what I'm seeing is that uh, uh, cultures are like are like clothing. You put you pull them off, you put them on, and they're they're essentially just like the the screen that you observe and interpret the world through. I don't even I, culture is not your friend as far as I'm concerned. It really inhibits you, and yeah, it defines you a little bit more than it, than I think people need to be defined. Demon in our culture has awful uh, has just a terrible sort of um, uh, a lot of baggage associated. Associated with that, is that true? Is that true worldwide? Like demon, because demon is just a translation of evil, nasty, invisible thing, or whatever. You know, well, not not exactly. The actual word demon it means disembodied spirit. That's all. So even angels would be demons under that category, under that definition. Not exactly, and this is where we have the hierarchy. See, these nephilim. You know, we, we, you read in the book of Jasher and this, that they've got 500 years to live. It says that God gives them 500 years to live on the earth and then they will die. Okay, well, they're flesh, right? They're flesh, but they're these hybrids. And they're actually called the deserters or the fallen ones. Now, so they're, they're the, demigod, the demigods of the ancient peoples in every culture. They've got these demigods. How many, how many of them got cast out? Well, you know, the, the book says that there's 200 of them. That's not what the Bible says. And, and, you know, these are, like I said before, they're non-canonical books, the Apocrypha. But uh, it says that 200 of them came down and created this mischief. And when we, and you know, when we look at the archaeology of this, too. So you've got the Sumerian texts, and I'd like to, to, to get on that for a minute. The Sumerian texts are all about uh, Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is his description. He is a giant. You've seen pictures of him for sure. He has a cat uh, in, in a stranglehold. That's not a cat. That's a lion. If you look at it very closely, it's a lion. So it shows his stature. Gilgamesh, as said by the Epic of Gilgamesh, he is the, he is the god of the gods and the sky god Anu. Okay, Anu is the Sumerians, um, they call him the, uh, the superior being. Well, he's one of the triads of gods in the Sumer culture, which replicates the Trinity, of course. But uh, Anu, is his constellation is Draco, which is dra the dragon or Satan. Oh wait 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 wait! Well, hold on a sec, hold on a sec. Um, because uh, Craig, I, I don't. I'm not a scholar of ancient history, so what I have to ask: Were the Sumerians? Uh, Sumerians weren't Christians, so how could how could one say that the 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 the, the constellation Draco, which is re represents a, uh, well, I don't even know when Draco became associated with a dragon. To be fair, but um, how can we say that the what is represented in Sumerian culture represents Satan, which is a totally different culture? Uh, no, it's not. It all has the same name. It all has the same, the same name. See, Cliff, this is one thing. You know, I'm one of these guys that's in an investigator 2.0. When you watch all of these paranormal shows on TV, everybody's just reciting the same old song and dance. Somebody says, oh, yeah, that's residual energy from Chuck who hung himself in 1882 and all this kind of stuff. What we're talking about here, this is a paradigm. Like, actually, we're talking about Bigfoot today, right? Bigfoot is not an anomaly. He is part of the paradigm of this, of demonology across the whole world. 
You want to throw aliens in there? That's exactly, we're mislabeling all of this stuff. It's all one and the same. It's all demons. It's all demonology. And demons come in different hierarchies. Uh, the actual demons and the disembodied spirits are actually the dead of the Nephilim because they're called earthborn. So they're part celestial, part terrestrial. But when they die, according to the Hebrew, Bi the Hebrew Bible, there's no salvation for them like there is for mankind. So they're stuck here in limbo until the judgment day. That is how the text describes this. So when these paranormal shows show you when they're, these guys are talking with EVPs, you know, and all this stuff, this is who they're talking to. These are the disembodied spirits, which is the actual term of demon. This is who they're talking to. Now, there's another group of them that many texts and the Septuagint and the Hebrew Bible all speak of, and that's the authorities and the principalities in high places. Okay, everybody thinks that Satan rules in hell. He doesn't rule in hell. He rules on earth, and his principalities are in the heavenlies. They're not in the heaven, but they're in the heavenlies. That's what we're told, and that's the understanding that makes everything come and fall into perspective. I'd like your backlash, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> if one isn't Christian... How does how does this affect all that? Well, that is great. That is great. See, whoever wrote the Sumerians that wrote the Epic of Gilgamesh, that is what's described. The Epic of Gilgamesh. You know, mark this for the for the letter. The Epic of Gilgamesh is a doctrine of demons. It gives you a false flood story. It gives you a false creation of the world and mankind and where they came from and how they were created. That's a doctrine of demons. And I'll give you something very interesting, that this cultish behavior by the Sumerians, which, you know, uh, secular uh, scholars call the cradle of civilization, well, they're actually absolutely right. They're located between the Euphrates and the Tigris River, which is, by all coincidence, the birthplace or the pre-flood place of Eden, the Bible of Eden, or the, uh, the, the uh, Eden of the Bible. Yeah, the Eden of the Bible. And after the Sumerians, who comes and takes that land? The Babylonians, the great evil of the Babylonians, who create all the pagan religions. And then after that, we've got Nineveh. And then we've got Iraq. See, Gilgamesh is the king of Uruk. Uruk becomes Iraq. <laughs> so, so you're saying that they created all the pagan religions. So you're saying the Native Americans and the Americas, they and like the aboriginals of Australia, that they're influenced by Babylonians who just, they didn't have ships. Yeah, they're influenced by the Babylonians. But remember, we have a story. We have a story called the Tower of Babel. And when the Tower of Babel was being erected, the Hebrew Bible says that, that God came down and confused all, all their languages and sent them out their separate ways. So these guys already had the prior knowledge, the prior religious and cultural aspects, and they took them with them to all the points of the globe. That's how we get all these, not only do we get all these uh, religions based from that pagan area of Mesopotamia, but we also get all of our languages from, which is really cool. <laughs> Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. The timeline doesn't seem to fit with the archaeological, paleoanthropological evidence. Because um, we have uh, human fossils that date over 300,000 years, right? Um, how, does one recon how does one reconcile that? Well, if you're a believer in, in Noah's flood, you've got pre-flood and then you've got post-flood. So, you know, some, there, you know, there are some Christian scholars that believe that the post or pre-flood time was longer. Others take the Bible literally and that uh, the, the age of the earth is 6,000 years. But that, that, that timeline, it doesn't interfere 
with the Sumerian culture coming in 2100 BC. This is, this is post-flood. The, the pre-flood is the Nephilim that we talked about in the beginning. But the Bible says that, and after that, which means that after the, after the flood, the Nephilim showed up again. So now we have, that, see, the Nephilim it described in the Bible and the, the rabbinical scholars, they believe, and it seems to be true when you look at the history of it, that these, we, you know, like I said in the beginning, this was the seed of Satan. There was a reason why that Satan created this. For one, third, for one thing, he only, the Bible tells us that one third of the angels fell. So for an army for Satan, he's deficient by two thirds. That's A. B is that uh, when he comes, he already knows, and it's written in the, in the first book of Genesis, that the Savior of the world is going to come. So what he does, this is why Noah shows up, he pollutes all of the gene pool of humankind. When the scripture gets to Noah, it says, and Noah was perfect in all his generations. And that word perfect in the original language is tanim. And it actually means a f no physical blemish to his generations. That's why Noah was chosen and God said, I'm going to wipe out the earth. See, a lot of Christian people have this wrong. They think that God wiped out the earth because man was evil. Yes, man was evil, but there was a worse problem was the gene pool was corrupted. You see, Satan was trying to prevent the seed of the woman who was the savior, Christ. That is the difference. Every war that we've ever had in history, you can put on a timeline and look at, at where it came from, where it originated from, and what's its cause. It is amazing. And like I said, guys, you know, th this isn't your typical, your typical uh, um, interview. This is 2 and 3.0 stuff, and it's, it's, it's scholarly and it's overwhelming. But, you know, when you seek into a subject... Let me explain it this way. If you're going to look for gold, I'm a metal detector guy. I love treasure hunting. When I decided that I wanted to look for gold, first of all, I had to research, where do I find gold? Because I live in the Coachella Valley and it's all sand. <laughs> so I'd have to go outside the Coachella Valley. First of all, I'd have to know where to look, how to look, and, and what tools and how I'm going to be able to do this. And, and, so you have to seek and see, this is what's, this is what's part of understanding our origins about things. Uh, you know, you can look up a silly word like, uh, I don't know, um, some silly word that everybody goes, Oh, I wonder what the, the, the origins of that is. And then you look it up. Somebody's already did that work for you, you know, and you find the origins of that. There's a reason for everything. All of these cultures that have spilled out their, their interpretations of what was going on in their mind, their heart, and their land was exactly what was happening all over the world. It was all the same entities acting, all the same players, but all were false gods and demons, and these were the doctrines of demons. Okay, They're all here for one reason. They're all here to prevent you, me, and everyone else from coming to know who God really is, who the creator was. That's why they have all these extracurricular uh, f flood story. And, the, you know, and because it was written before the Bible, it makes it more true. Well, that, that doesn't that doesn't hold water at all. No pun intended. But uh, and creation where men came from. Uh, the Indians have all their creation stories. You know, th this this is the game. The whole world, if you want to believe, if you believe in a 6,000 year world, this whole world is the age of deceit. And we're seeing it no more like today. Everything is fake. But uh, the 6,000 year world I, is, I mean, it's clearly demonstrably incorrect. Well, many would argue that. <laughs> I, uh, many do argue that, but they can't argue that using the evidence at well, hand. Well, look at the coelacanth. They said it's 50 billion years old or whatever. No, no, I think it's 24 million. Well, they, they, sharks as well, right? Yeah, but they haven't changed. Oh, they have. Actually, there's fewer species now, for example. Um, yeah, but and that's like not a change. You're not changing from a fish to a bird. See, that's the premise of evolution that doesn't work. And I'll tell you something, Cliff. All of the real 
scientists out there, they're bailing from evolution left and right, because that's why the alien theory is so popular. It's a pretty strong statement that all of the scientists are bailing from evolution. I, I think that there's a small percentage fringe that are uh, bailing from evolution. But um, but there, but again, I think what the thing that the thing that I guess bothers me about what you're saying is that everything you're saying uh, is, is premised by the the, the Christian foundation. And, um, and, and I'm not going to debate Christianity because it's a matter of faith and, you know, you can find all the faults you want in the Bible or all the truth or whatever, whatever you're looking for, you're going to find it. But when it comes to physical evidence, you know, uh, we have evidence of civilizations that were very old. You know, we have, we have fossils of humans and human ancestors, um, that clearly don't, that don't jive with a, a guy and a na naked guy and a naked girl in a garden and a snake, you know, um, it, there's there's a there's a tremendous amount of evidence and, and see evolution isn't exactly they say the theory of evolution but they don't say theory in the way that it, it, it's it, it's not true they say theory in the same way that the the, the theory of gravity um, you know you drop a pencil it's gonna fall there, there's some evidence there and but the theory part of gravity is that we are always tweaking and refining it we know that it's true but now, now it's trying to get all the details. Okay, so does gravity work on a universe-wide scale? Does gravity work on a subatomic scale? And that's when we find um, discrepancies between the observable data in the, uh, in, the, in the experiments and then our theories, our numbers, that we have to tweak a little bit to try to get it right. And that's where we are with evolution now. Evolution is, in fact, a done deal, and we're just tweaking and learning more about it. And it will always be a theory because new species are always being discovered and being fit into the paradigm and we're moving things around. But I think it's a done deal at this point that evolution is in fact a real thing. Well, I'll tell you, this is why the alien theory is so prominent nowadays is because the Darwinian theory just doesn't hold it anymore. The scientists, many scientists are going, you know, the evidence for, for divine creation for a creator far outweighs evolution. Evolution has so many problems with it. And this is where you getting this alien stuff from, because now that they're believing, now that they're believing that evolution isn't quite what it's cracked up to be or what we've been fed, that it is more, more uh, congruent uh, that, that aliens, there must be life from, from another planet. There must be somebody else more intelligent than us. Let's put it that way. That's really what everybody is saying. Now, some people, some people are calling it God and some people are calling it aliens. And when I, I think, and I'll go to their defense, that when some people use the word alien, they don't use it as aliens, you know, like gray people with weird looking arms and silly things like that. But uh, uh, foreign entities, if you want to put it that way. But, you know, when we look, when we do the research and look over the whole world Everything that has gone on in everyone's culture, and then you put it on a timeline, and you you put what they believe in, but it all is the same. It all comes out to the same thing. And like I said, they all have the same three stories. That can't be true, because I don't believe this. Well, th th then you don't believe what history has told you. I mean, every culture on the planet has has given you this this ancestry even right to our own doorstep here with the indians they have their flood story they have their celestial uh, um visitations and then they have their demigods everybody's got that story but what do you you got to do something with it if everybody's got the same story what's going on here see that's a validity that's what i was talking about a principle that is what has value and you can't take like there's a saying that says you know you can't Without listening to the information, you can't already make a decision about it. That is the fool, foolheartedness of a man. You have to search it yourself. But the flood stories, the Native American flood story, like there's geological evidence of that. Like, yeah, it almost certainly a consequence of the um, the ice ca ice caps melting away. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think that a flood happened. They're different. They're different ones. I'm saying the one that happened in where they got the evidence in Turkey and Mount Arafat and all that. That's not the same flood. Those are different floods. 
that would be up for debate as well. So, well, the ice caps have receded many times over the last, you know, X number of hundred thousand years, and every one of those would increase the, the like be labeled a flood by somebody who had who was displaced from their homeland and had to move to higher elevations. Um, again, I, th- I think that we're looking at uh, a his like the Bible, for example. Take that. Um, I was raised Christian. I don't exactly c- consider myself anything at this point. Just like I'm not a political party, I'm not a religion as well. You know, I just don't like definitions like that. Um, um, so uh, I think that uh, the Bible or any other text from any other culture is just a cultural um, view on things around them. So if sa- uh, say, let's go back to the Bigfoot thing, because this is what the podcast is about. Um, in the Middle East, there were all sorts of, uh, we have all sorts of fossils of human ancestors and offshoots thereof. Um, there was actually one just released this past week, a brand new species of human that was just, uh, Homo, uh, uh, is a genus, of course. The name escapes me, but it was named after the place in Israel where it was dug up. In fact, there were two species released that just this past week. One uh, made the news because it has a way catchier name, Dragon Man, and the other one has a much more boring name that is some sort of Neanderthal um, relative, close relative of. And it, that was discovered in Israel. Well, um, if the idea, which my model of the Sasquatch is that of the relict hominoid, um, all sorts of species of human-like things existed and some have persisted until the present day is the bottom line. But if you go back far enough, um, and I, when I say far enough, it's not very far, 20,000 years, 12,000 years, um, there probably were Neanderthals, and they, they might even still be there. I think the Almasty of Eastern Europe, for example, is probably some sort of relic hominoid, relic uh, Neanderthal or Denisovan or something like that. Um, the people living there uh, in small towns and hunter gatherer sort of things, and start, when they started uh, doing agriculture and building cities and all that sort of stuff, they would have known about these other human like things that kind of looked like them, but were probably hairier and had different ways living in the woods and doing stuff. They had to explain them somehow. And so they invented names for them and fit them into their mythology. And whether it's the Middle East or in China or in Australia or wherever it was, to explain animals that kind of looked like them in the woods, they, ma- they made up names for them and incorporated them into their mythology and creations and all that other stuff. Um, I think that uh, the biblical uh, perception, the biblical culture, which you seem very well founded in, and you're a great scholar and I appreciate talking to you about, is just another veil that we're looking through. Uh, it's just a cultural filter that people are, are deciphering and um, interpreting the, the reality around them through. Yeah, I, I like I said, I would I I would debate you on that for the simple reason as most people that say that lack the education of actually diving into this stuff and proving it wrong for themselves. So I would want to ask you a question about. Uh, uh, so when your your explanation of who Bigfoot is. Um, do you, do you think it's intelligent, like a human being? I think it's intelligent. Well, not as, I mean, I think, well, here's another thing. I think that's another cultural bias. I think that when we look at um, intelligence of other animals, we're always judging it by our own intelligence. Well, I don't think that's a fair comparison because if you drop you, me or Bobo in the woods with no clothes, we're not going to survive as long as Sasquatches are. So they have a different kind of intelligence than we do. How long have you think they've been around? Um, I think Sasquatches have been around as long as all the other animals have been around. It depends what they are, really. Well, here's my question. If they have intelligence, then how come they don't build cities? That means they're stupid. <laughs> well, not necessarily, because bears aren't exactly stupid, right? But now let's go to the other apes, for example. Orangutans are generally thought to be this amongst the, the smartest of the apes um, because of their pensive sort of manner. Um, and, and the experiments that have done with chimpanzees, gorillas, and, and orangutans, for example, um, it, the, the way, like, if you give a, if you give all three of those ape species a puzzle, like a thing uh, that yet they have to open up in order to get food or something like that, uh, chimpanzees will bang on it and try to break it and then mess around with it until they figure it out. Gorillas are most likely to look at it and say, well, screw that. That's kind of hard and, de- and go deal with something else, get food elsewhere. Orangutans will play with it for a few minutes and then go to the other side of the enclosure, wherever the experiment's happening, and keep looking over at it. And you know, this could last 5, 10, 15 minutes. And then they'll go over and they'll just open it on the first try. So um, orangutans are... house, though. <laughs> no, no, because they have no need for that is the thing. Yes, well, th- this brings me up to my next point is that if if you believe that they aren't that their intelligence isn't uh, uh, calculable, 
then how do we explain? No, it's not comparable. It's, I didn't say it's not this incalculable. I don't think it's fair to compare other species to our own version of intelligence. Just like if we're looking for intelligent life in the universe, we're looking at we're looking for something that looks like us. And that's kind of narcissistic as a species, in my opinion. I think we need to broaden our definition of what intelligence is. Dolphins are highly intelligent, but they and they survive things that we could never survive, and they they solve different kinds of problems in different sort of ways that we can't. It's it's hard to compare the two things. Sasquatches are in our very, very closely related to us. Clearly, they look like us. They're, they're an ape species, just like we are. They're very intelligent, but I think that they've uh, used their uh, intelligence in a different way than we have. And they're not using fire. It's like what Bobo says. I, I say that they're somewhere between the other apes and us and, and whatever sort of measurable intelligence by human standards. Bobo says they're smarter because they don't have jobs and pay taxes. And he may be right. right. <laughs> well, here, here's my question that I'm leading up to. Then uh, if their intelligence is not comparable, then how do we explain his elusiveness? Their elusiveness? The same way that uh, you explain uh, black bears' elusiveness. We see black bears all the time, though. Here's well, I'm going to challenge that too. Um, here in my state of Oregon, there are between 30 and 35,000 black bear. I've lived here for 12, 15 years now, or something like that. And I think it's fair to say I may spend more time in the woods than your average person. Okay. Cause just cause what I do and my affinity towards it and all that sort of stuff. During my time, the last 12 or so, 12, 15 years here in Oregon, I think I've seen maybe maybe uh, a dozen at the most black bears caught brief glimpses of them. And that's out of 30 to 35,000 animals. Now, Sasquatches being very rare animals, there might be only maybe 300 if Grover Krantz is right, about 101 ratio black bears to Sasquatches, uh, 300 Bigfoots in the entire state. And I've seen maybe a dozen of these 35,000 black bears. It, it doesn't, that's not that difficult to stay out of sight. Black bears um, are extraordinarily elusive um, largely nocturnal, but not exclusively, and they don't want anything to do with this. So the same way Bigfoot is. Well, I would, uh, I would definitely, definitely take a different stance on that because of their elusiveness. Not, you know, to this day, we still don't have. I mean, we've got concrete proof of black bears, but we don't have have concrete proof proof of this. And I'm not saying they don't they don't exist because I I do believe they exist, but I don't think you and me agree on who exactly they are. I think they're prodigy, prodigy of fallen angels. And if they're supposed to live 500 years, that's only eight generations from the time of the Sumerian texts. And there's a reason, there's a reason why they're elusive to me. Uh, but, you know, to the rest of the world that says, hey, listen, nobody gets a good picture. Nobody gets a dead body. Nobody gets a, and if it's just an animal with marginal, marginal intelligence, you know, how is it that it's been so, so elusive to everyone, even when they go hunting for them? I mean, there's something about that that brings it into, let me put it this way. When you see a flying saucer make a right-hand turn at 7,000 miles an hour, this points to another dimension. This is exactly what Albert Einstein was talking about in the theory of relativity, but he didn't take it to the fifth dimension. If he would have taken it to the fifth dimension, he would have figured it out. Einstein's theory of relativity wasn't figured out until later on when other scientists put it to the test and made it work. So my point being is as men, as men, the conquerors of this earth for thousands of years, and we're not able to, to, to bring forth a creature that is running around, that is running around in our very backyards, throwing rocks, screaming, yelling. Nobody can get a heat signature on it. Nobody can get in. That tells me that points to something greater than the physical world. And that is a characteristic to me that when you study and investigate and bring all your points together, that has to be dealt with, which shows that there's something beyond just an animal running around in the forest that no one that has been so greatly elusive that no one's been able to get a picture of. That to me points to another specific narrative that not only do other cultures back up, and I'm not just going to say, I'm not just talking about the Bible, but all of the cultures, okay? And that you've got to be able to answer that 
not with, well, he's just elusive and he's good at, uh, and he sees you coming and he runs away. And that is not good enough in the science world. That is not good enough to just say he's been, he's elusive. He just runs away from everybody. So that to me points to another narrative that makes this supernatural. I'm not saying that he's not physical. I do believe that he's physical, but I believe that this, there's the spiritual connection to it as well. Your thoughts? My thoughts is that I think your premises are incorrect to start off with. Um, there are actually some very good photographs. Bobo and I have both seen them. Um, they have not. A lot of these. Have, have, a lot of them have not been made public, um, unfortunately, because of uh, the worries by the people who own them that they will be ridiculed and it might affect their job. And there's all sorts of things like that. And also people who do go out looking for Sasquatches actually do find them sometimes. Um, the only one I've seen, I was looking for them. I think Bobo has a, a number of sightings under his belt. Perhaps they're not all excellent, but he was also generally looking for them at the time. Um, and again, I think the rarity of the species is a, is a huge factor here, a huge factor. Um, and also that they outclass us in the woods in every way possible. Yeah, but they don't like outclass man's technology and, and smarts. Right now, they kind of do because the, the best technology we have for this sort of stuff that's publicly available is thermal imagers, which don't see through forest cover. Um, and we're also limited by our own situation. I think a lot of the problem of what uh, of the, the problem that you've identified is that we don't have a dead one for science to investigate and write or it anything. Written. Well, no, that we, anything we I, I mean, nothing I'm, concrete. I'm, um, well, I mean, in the words of Rene de Hinden, let me hit you over the head with this Bigfoot cast and tell me if it's concrete or not. I'm not saying they don't exist, but what I'm saying is what I'm challenging you is their actual identity. I believe they exist. I think both you and me do understand that. Oh, sure, but sure, it's sure, their sure. Identity that I'm not agreeing with. That's oh, all. yeah. But as far as something, nothing concrete. Well, we do have hairs that are clearly primate that don't match any other species found in North America. We have a three, three or four hundred footprint casts that are generally internally congruent with different morphologies and anatomies and human footprints of that size. Not that humans really have feet that are 14, 16 inches long, um, but uh, but all of those are internally congruent. We they're actually is physical evidence for this sort of thing. The only thing we lack is a body because no one has managed to kill one and bring one in yet. And I don't necessarily advocate for that, I did, but I also realize that's what science needs. Um, and part of that is because hunters, uh, despite what the, the media portrays them as, are not the, the gun-toting hillbillies shooting up the woods side when they go into the woods. The number one rule of hunting is you never shoot anything unless you know exactly what it is you're shooting at. And turns out Sasquatches look a lot like humans wearing suits. Um, so th you, like how, how ballsy would you have to be to drop one of these things knowing for sure that it could not be a human in a suit? Because it may or may not be illegal to shoot a Sasquatch, but it is clearly illegal to shoot a jackass in a monkey suit. Yeah, I would agree with you there. There, you know, in in the in the science world, there are out of a hundred percent of all the cases, there's hoaxes, there's other explanations, and then there's the truth. And the truth is seems to be a very very small percentage of that. And uh, you know, in every field, we get all of that. We get all of those things, and we have to decipher the truth. And you know, this is really what I'm about. I mean, I've been doing this kind of stuff for for decades. And the, the, the punctuation for me is like, you guys actually go out and you're, you're in it. You know, you guys are looking, you're on the front line looking for physical evidence. You know, my evidence is that, no pun intended, everything leaves a footprint. And it's going to be in the records somewhere. And I'm not talking about sightings of Bigfoot in every country on the planet. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the origins of these things. And of course, that's controversial. It's controversial, but the truth is there somewhere. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. I do think that Nephilim are probably uh, the, was it ancient Hebrews, I'm guessing? Ancient Hebrews' interpretation of what they're seeing around them. Just like in the Epic of Gilgamesh, I think Enkidu is a clear reference to an unknown hominoid of some, por some point put into their mythology. Just like, uh, um, I, don't, I don't have the names of the, um, uh, it starts with the T and escapes me, but I, I, um, in Australia, they had uh, you know, the, the stories of the, uh, 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 the Yowies, and they called them other things. And just like in the Pacific Northwest, they called them, you know, Zon 
Monaco or Buquas or whatever. They're in, I, I think that the people are just explaining what they're observing around them. So yeah, I, I'm I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you that you if you look at the historical record, you can find echoes of Sasquatches and other unknown hominoids being present on the landscape around the humans that were living there. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Not at all. Because I believe it, as you do. My issue is from my research is the identity. That is, and that is the key of everyone. The key of ev- for everyone and everything is the identity of something because the identity is the DNA of it. And I don't mean the physical DNA, I mean the actual truth of the matter. You know, and that's where you, if, if you, you know, when you want to search for truth, you've got to dig deep. Uh, you know, I don't just study. I just don't study uh, um, biblical texts and stuff like that. I study archaeology, physics, quantum physics, biology, because if we're going to talk about Bigfoot, there's biology, there's physics, there's quantum physics, there's everything, because everything that moves has physics, quantum physics, biology, you know, archaeology, all of these kind of things, you know. So, you know, I talked to Josh Gates about this kind of stuff, and he told me he's his understanding was to search for the truth and he told me like read my book man so i bought his book and i I read his book he says that's exactly what i'm into is finding the truth i read his book and his book was basically describing how he went to mexico and got fleas and went on this expedition his plane crashed there was no truth in it at all no the truth was he wanted you to buy it yeah no yeah (laughs) no kidding but i i took him at his word i took him at his word to land i'm not i'm not throwing him under the bus or anything i think he's a great guy but uh, the, the truth, the truth is what you have to look for. And the truth isn't in the forest. That's really what I'm saying. The truth is not in the forest. I think what I'm saying is that the truth about, I don't know, black bears is not culturally dependent. Yes, but we know everything about black bears. <laughs> well, I, but, the, the, but, the, but, but listen to, listen to the, what I'm really saying here is like the, the truth behind elk or um, mega mouse sharks or coelacanths, as you mentioned, the, the truth, whatever the word truth means in this situation, is, the, the isn't culturally dependent. Um, it isn't based on the foundational beliefs of any particular religion or culture. It's there, it's, it's there outside the realm of that culture, period. Well, that means that truth is not absolute. And then you got a real problem there because then nothing matters and nothing is true. I disagree. I am saying the truth is absolute and it's not subjective um, because cultural perspectives are subjective. Well, then, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Then what is the truth? What is the truth in any matter that we look at? You have to look at the origins. The origins describes the truth because that's where it originates from. That's what the word means. The original And that's, see, what I'm really talking about here is exactly what I said in the very beginning. You know, when you look at a car crash, you have to walk around all four sides to see the real impact of the car crash. Because one side of it, if you're just saying on one side and go, yeah, yeah, we've got prints, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this. It's like you're you're looking at the crash from one side, which has, you know, no scratches on the car. But, you know, I'm walking around the whole thing. I'm saying, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're seeing, you know, um, and then I look at everybody else's. And then where are we finding this? Where are we finding the origins of this? What is the foundation? What is the value? What holds water here? You know, I mean, not to discredit you, but you've been bringing up, you know, black bears, but black bears and Bigfoot are two absolutely different things. We have all the knowledge we care to know about about black bears. And if Bigfoot is just another uh, animal bigger than a black bear, you know, why can we not pin him down in any country, in any time, even when this isn't culturally acceptable to shoot him or whatever, how come we have never been able to find him in the 1800s, the 1700s, the 1600s, farther and farther and farther and back? You know, there's just no evidence. And that points to something that is beyond our comprehension. See, this is what I'm getting at. You can talk to me about hairs and hit me on the head with a footprint and stuff, but that doesn't make the evidence real. See, that's the, that's the conclusion. The truth is, has not been, has not been established. We know the truth about black bears. There's nothing more to tell. 
about black bears. But with Bigfoot, that's a really gray area. And there's a reason why it's gray. And that's my only point about talking to you guys about this today. Evidence, but there, evidence and proof are two different things. Uh, there's no definitive proof for Bigfoot right now. And that's a problem. Uh, it's a huge problem. I, I get and that. I understand why people, I mean, that's a, and I understand that's why people have paranormal aspects associated with them or supernatural, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I mean, I've, I've personally talked to people that have shot them and seen them dead. And they were so freaked out by how human it looked. They just, did, they just left. Like they didn't want to deal with it. Well, I would respond to that because that's what the Bible says, that they're the progeny of fallen angels and human women. That, 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 that's the truth of the matter. There's nothing beyond that. There's nothing post that. See, as far back as you can go, that's as far back as you can go. That's the origins. That is the origin of it. There's no, you can't go any, anything farther back if you're going to say it's you know, some creature from a million years ago. That is absolute speculation. No one was there in a, a million years ago. There's no written record. There's no lies. I mean, we know that half the culture lies about, you know, the pharaonic table. You know, they lie about their conquests, you know. So this is, this is what I mean about searching for truth. We can't just take people, you know, at their word. I would, I would su suggest even today that no one take me at my word, you know, study, look, look, once you have every piece of evidence, like I gave you that scenario about the, the I investigators putting all the pictures, the suspects on the wall, put your big foot suspect, big, huge picture on the wall, and then begin to look at all the derivatives of all of this, you know, like an investigation. You know, going out in the field is one thing, but researching the, the when, where, why, how, where, you know, the beginnings of it, that is where you're going to get closer to the truth. You know, we might not be able to, there are things that we'll never know, of course. I, th I think that that paradigm um, takes an assumption that the truth started with history, with written accounts. I'm not saying that. <laughs> Anything that's ever recorded of it, that's of any value was recorded. So it wouldn't have had to been recorded. So many cultures um, have persisted for, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years through oral tradition. Yes, but that's proving my point. That's proving my point. And they all have the same story. Even if they're 12,000 miles away, that exactly proves my point. Does it? I don't, maybe I don't understand the point you're trying to make then. Maybe can you, can you rephrase your uh, point so I can understand it better then? Because to me, that does the opposite. It kind of okay, shows so you. If, if we look at, if we're taking Bigfoot, for example, and we put a picture of him on the wall, and we're investigators, now we're going to put all these things on the wall that we know about history, where it came from, every written word we have, every possible every possible a paragraph from Sanskrit, from the Bible, from the Septuagint, from it, and then we put it all on the wall and we begin to draw lines. Ah, do these follow in line with the timeline of when these people saw this? Blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. As you go down, this is the narrative that investigators... See, the way I look at things is that when people investigate that word, that is a very shallow and narrow, narrow word for when people investigate that, you know, I see all these paranormal shows with all these investigations, which consists of a guy or a girl going into a, a building and calling out the name of somebody who died there and then making an interpretation of that. That is not even close to the in investigation that should be done. You see, you're missing all these aspects, and therefore, they don't show up in your conclusions. See, does that make sense? Yes, but um, when we look at the written record, that only goes back so far, because humans existed long before the written record, right? I, I'm a believer that the world is only 6,000 years old. I believe what the Bible says. Oh, see, I see that, that's what, see, and again, I think, I think that the reality of Sasquatches, just like the reality of, I don't know, let, let's... Let's say that real, the reality of granite or anything else that we can point to and say, yeah, that's a real thing. I think that their realities um, exist outside of cultural paradigms. And um, it's clear that you're coming from the perspective of a, of a, a fundamentalist kind of uh, more or less fun, I mean, squishy fundamentalist um, Christian um, foundation. 
So all of your interpretations are colored by that. Just well, like I'm all using of my, all, everyone else's interpretation too. How, how about would it be fair to say largely um, a Christian a foundation? Then in that in that case, I don't want, I don't want to box you in. Just like I'm largely coming from the, the cultural perspective of someone who looks at evidence and how it fits together in the most scientific paradigm. Um, some people say that science is a religion, and I, I disagree with that. I think it's a way of thinking. I think it's a problem solving method. It should be a verb, really, in my opinion, um, of getting to the truth. But um, see, I'm coming from a different cultural paradigm. But no matter whose cultural paradigm you come from, in my it seems to me that black bears are real. They're, they're, the reality exists separate from any cultural paradigm. Every human on the planet can disappear today, um, and black bears would still be around. Um, but they're not dependent on cultural paradigms or cultural foundations. And I think Sasquatches are the same way. Yeah, but we still have the problem. We still have the problem of the evidence. We don't have the evidence. I mean, if you're talking to... No, secular, we, don't, no we don't have the proof. I think that we need to clarify the language here. There's plenty of evidence. Yeah, well, the evidence, you know, I mean, we don't know how many people... I mean, this is 2021. You know how many Sasquatch suits you can go online and buy? <laughs> There's, yeah, but how many compelling ones? There are very, very few. Yeah, but, you know, you make footprints, you know, I don't know. And like I said, I'm on the same page as you guys. I believe they exist. It's just in the identity and the problem I have is there's a reason why you're not getting the proof. You're not getting the concrete proof that even the secular scientists would love to see. So they could go, ah, yes, let's put this in our book, you know. And that's, that's an issue that is over everyone's head. And there's a reason because there's a spiritual connection. And that's all I'm really saying uh, about this. Well, there's certainly a swath of Bigfooters out there that would 100% agree with you on this. Um, but I, I, again, I'm going to go I, from, I, I understand your stance and I think you understand mine that I, I that the, the cultural spirituality depends on the person who believes in it, honestly, is what it comes down to. And I think if you remove that person, Bigfoots are still there. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, but there's no way to find that out, unfortunately. Yeah, but so is spirituality. <laughs> you can be an atheist and not believe. <laughs> Well, atheist had his own flavor of spirituality, too. So, I'm not sure how Native people would feel about all this. I'd be interested in some Native perspective on this because uh, some Indigenous folks weighing in or something. Just because uh, they, the traditions of Sasquatches go back so much further with the Native people. Sure, and I agree with you. I didn't disagree with you about that. Like I said, it's just the identity. I believe. I believe. I've read all the Hopi. With the star people, and I've read all of that stuff. I believe it all, and I'm on the same page as you where, where they say that they are communicating the best way they can about what the, it is they've saw, heard, spoke to. I totally agree, but it's the identification of those things that my research has brought to a different who the entities are. See, to me, Bigfoot's not an anomaly. He's part of the whole paradigm of demonology. They are not anomalies to me either. They're part of the natural environment. Yeah, and that's where you and me would disagree. <laughs> because you can't bring <laughs> me one and say, here's my, here's my Bigfoot friend. See, he's been elusive because, you see, with that, that's why I would disagree, you know? What if a body comes in? What if a body comes in next week and we got DNA and... Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Bobo, that's going to happen. And I'll make a bold statement that is going to happen because the Bible tells us that in the end times, men's hearts will fail them for fear what they're about to see. I wouldn't be afraid to see that. I'd be stoked to see that, you know? It's more than that. It's, it's more complex than that. Yeah, it's, it's uh, that, like I said, that's a whole nother show. <laughs> <laughs> we got to have you back like three more times now. Yeah, but in general, I believe, I believe you guys. I believe, I believe that there's something that it's just the identity that I have the issue with. You know, I believe that, you know, the calls, you know, the screams and stuff like that. I, I believe that. Of course. Of course. They are physical, but there's a spiritual component to them that makes them unavailable. And that's the thing that points to another direction. Just like I said about the uh, about physics and quantum physics. That's how all science works. That when you see a law broken, it points to another law. That's how we figured out things. And that's my basis. 
I've certainly known a fair number of Sasquatch Bigfoot kind of aficionados who have uh, done the flesh and blood thing for long enough and eventually got frustrated and started dabbling in other areas that um, are unverifiable, of course. And and I think this is one of those um, in, in a lot of ways at this point. Um, and the th- thing that bothers me, I guess, about uh, jumping off of the boat into the, the waters of Wu is that, um, and in, in this case, I think it's one of those things, and I don't mean that necessarily in a demeaning way, but is that all the various uh, explanations that are left after the flesh and blood uh, um, train has been left, you know, left behind, um, are, they don't, they don't jive very well together. Um, and so many people find their truth elsewhere that, and that truth doesn't, um, it isn't congruent, you know, it's not like, oh, the, well, the flesh and blood thing can't be real. So it must be this once they, once they leave the flesh and blood thing, which is the most congruent theory, by the way, um, it, it's, it, 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 it conflicts with all the other different perspectives. Um, and I, it always reminds me of what John Green said. It does us no good to explain one unknown with another. It doesn't get us, it doesn't get the ball further down the field, so to speak, you know? You know, one thing we didn't talk about is, is, uh, uh, purpose. You know, every, every animal has a purpose and this Bigfoot, you know, from my perspective and my research is there for two, for two things. I told you that if they live, if they live 500 years, if you believe that from the apocryphal books, which are non-canonical, um, that's eight generations. That's eight generations. The Bible tells us that in the end times, Jesus said this, that in the end times, it will be just like the days of Noah. And what I just explained to you, that the days of Noah were all about the Nephilim. So there's a preservation of DNA there. And the other point is that all of these things, these paranormal things, all of these things, like I said, Bigfoot's not an anomaly. He's all part of the demonological group. All of these things are to lead, to lead people and humans down rabbit holes so that you won't believe and won't follow the Lord. And I suspect that you guys have probably been doing this all your life. So chasing the rabbit all your life. I mean, people do that with all kinds of things because those are what's called idols. And we worship those idols and we spend all of our time and energy on those things. And this is another point that I believe that is part of the demonological stratagem of this and all of the paranormal things. Because I can... I've done speeches and talks on UFOs, Roswell, all of these. They all stem from the exact same thing. They all stem from the same thing. They're to distract you. You know, we have, we have all these conspiracy theories about the government. They're doing all this to distract you. Well, that's a very, it's a very, uh, um, a very great stratagem to take people out of their life is to get them to follow something for their whole life. So, uh, these are the these are the basis of, of of my views and my research, and I have just loved talking to you guys because I love to hear I love debates I love people give me another perspective you know this is what I'm all about because this is what research does it helps us bounce ideas off each other, and 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 come to some sort hey I didn't think about that you know that's a that's a heavy point you know and th- this is what th- this is all about and I, I hope that everyone listening is really uh, being able to glean some information from this because it is a controversial to- topic. I mean, hands down. And I love your point, by the way. I really, really do because um, so many people nowadays, especially with our polarized political situation and and just all the crazy nonsense that's going on nowadays, um, uh, they're afraid of dissent. They're afraid of opposing points of view, you know? Um, and I think that's absolutely crazy of them. I think it's fearful. Um, they're, 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 they've uh, drawn the cloak of fear around themselves and because um, they're, they're probably threatened, like their own perspective is threatened. If you can't talk with somebody who disagrees with you about points like what we're doing today, then you know what? Then it seems to me you're pretty insecure in what you believe is what is the way I always thought of it. I, people, um, I, I welcome dissent. I welcome differing points of views like yours. It doesn't mean I have to agree with you and you don't have to agree with mine. I don't care. You're, you're a lovely person anyway, you know? Um, and in today's society, we demonize, oh, oh, I didn't even think about using that word, but I, we demonize people who think differently than us. Well, that shows your own insecurity, whether we're talking about politics or religion or anything else. 
One thing I can absolutely guarantee all of us is that whatever the the entire truth is, it is beyond our understanding. And all we can do is do the best we can until we die, right? So I don't know, that's kind of my take on it. Pretty much, yeah. We, and we all have our own models of the universe and we're moving through this weird situation that we've been thrust into and just hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, it is a great topic. And you know, you made some you made some great points. And I, I love the point, you know, where you said that. You know, we really do have to to listen to each other because, you know, there. Like I said, it's it. You can have four people standing on the corner when the accident happened, and everybody saw a different things. Somebody saw somebody's arm flip somebody off out one side, and on the other side, somebody threw a gun out the window. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, what I, I say something. Uh, you know, if, if if you ask five bigfooters their opinions, you're going to get seven answers. Exactly. <laughs> And I do appreciate your perspective and your uh, your scholar your scholarliship, I guess, or scholarliness, I guess, whatever word I'm looking for, you know. Um, I, and I, I do also appreciate your patience with me and your open mindedness to listen to what I have to say, and also Bobo, because um, I think that a lot of people listening um, are going to disagree, and I also think that a lot of people listening are going to agree with you. Um, I think that you've um, you're probably resonating with a, a significant percentage of our audience in some sort of way. And I want to thank you for coming on Bigfoot and Beyond and sharing your perspective. Um, with our listeners and whatnot, because the people who agree with you are going to feel validated and the people who don't agree with you are, are not going to, and it doesn't really matter, um, but it's good to listen to other perspectives. And that's my point. And it makes great dinner conversation, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's Absolutely. been great, guys. Love you guys. It's been so, so much fun. I love talking about this. And, uh, you know, the, the more adverse it is, the more funner it is, because we really get to, you know, bowling ball back and forth. And that, that's what makes it so great. Right. I have nothing but respect for you. I want to make that totally clear. So the person who writes me next to tell me what a jerk I am and how I'm the worst interviewer ever. Um, I, I'm just going to say you're incorrect. Michael likes me. Yes, it was awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Bobo. Love you guys. You've been great. It was wonderful. Love to do it again sometime on maybe talk about something else. That would be awesome. Oh, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much. Much love, my brother. All right, Bobo. That was a fun one. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of feedback on this one. Hopefully, uh, a lot of prayers for Cliff. I could use every one, trust me. Yeah, I appreciate him coming on. and That was a good one, Cliff, and I'm looking forward to our next week's guest. Yeah, me too, Bubs. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. And once again, let's all pray for Cliff's eternally damned soul. And uh, until next week, keep it squashy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond. That's an N in the middle. And tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond. 